All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us here. Everybody's starting to kind of flow in. So we'll just give everybody a little bit of time here to join the webinar. Appreciate everybody taking the time today. While everybody's joining, um, joining the webinar here, if you could go into the chat or in the Q&A box, just let me know if you can hear me okay, if you can see me all right, I'll give you a big thumbs up there so we can see if the video is moving here. Um, just drop something in there, let me know that you hear me loud and clear. Thumbs up, thank you, Chris, Tate, yes and yes, thank you, Katie, awesome. Thank you everyone for letting me know, we are good to go. Well, just to keep us on time here, we'll go ahead and get this webinar started. We've got a good number of people on. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a few more flowing in here as we go along. Uh, my name is Matthew Shoemaker. I'm the Product and Partner Marketing Manager here at Banyan Technology. I'm going to be your MC today, kick off the webinar, and then I'm going to hand it over to our very uh, talented hosts here. Um, we're going to be talking about seamless shipping solutions how to combine best-in-class over-the-road and parcel technology. We invited our friends over at ProShip onto the webinar here to help uh, share some awesome information and to, uh, yeah, cover this amazing topic here. So again, I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping here. So we are recording this webinar. It will be sent out to you within 72 hours. Um, so you can always comment on that coming through to your inbox. For a better experience, an audio and visual experience, we do ask that you close out anything that could be updating in the background. Uh, if you have an email box open or a chat, sometimes they're up or updating in the background and always getting messages through, uh, which can interfere with the experience a little bit and cause audio and visual lag. So please do take a moment to close those out. And lastly, we love questions. So please do engage with us throughout the webinar. Um, pop your questions in the Q&A box there. Um, and then we'll go ahead and do our best to answer as many as time permits. And we have a slot at the end of this webinar as well uh, to catch as many as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to our very capable hosts. Alan, you there? Yes, sir. I am. You hear me? Oh, I can hear you indeed. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate you launching this. Uh, I'm excited to do this. I And I, I'm more excited... I appreciate the topic, but one of my all-time favorite people, Justin, and, and I say all-time favorite, we've been recent friends, I think is the way to say it, Justin, as our companies have worked together. Fascinating man. If you, outside of this, if you ever want to talk to him about, geez, whatever, it's uh, it's cuisine, art, jazz, and we went down a crazy nuclear power thing one time. That was fascinating to me as well. But Justin Kramer is my co-host with ProChef. Welcome, Justin. I'm glad you're, you're, you're joining us. Thank you, Alan. Um, so let's go, um, let's move to the, I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide. What I want to do is go over the agenda. I, I don't know how many of you ever had like a, a, a speech class, right? In, in, in college. And they used to tell you, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them what you told them. So I'm doing this first part here. We're going to go do an overview of Banyan. We're going to do an overview of ProShip. Now I know the Banyan overview, this is my friends on here. I see some folks, Tony Sneed, Tate Harris, all that. I know you're going to sleep a little bit during that section, but pay attention on the ProShip side. These guys are very cool. We're going to talk a bit about the environment right now uh, that we're in, particularly Q3, Q4, what's happening. Uh, Justin has some really good insight on that. Um, and how do you prepare, right? How do you take the technology part of what you do to prepare for that? Uh, we're going to get a, I, I don't it's really related in, in in the complexity of what we're doing in shipping. It's it's much more complex than it used to be, uh, and, and and how hard it is to simplify. But I think we'll close it out and say, but it's not as hard if you hang out with some best of breed solutions, which of course is going to mean pro ship and banning. So we'll chit chat about that. We'll talk about an integration at the end. So let me get to that very first part. Tell you a bit about um, um, Banyan. You all can read these things. If you were to take a look at this and say, let me walk away from that, I would tell you the first thing is, um, if you need to ship something and it's got rubber tires on the road and it's North America between Pro Ship and Banyan, we got you covered. Okay, so I'm very comfortable. Banyan's been around for a while. We have lots of people doing what we do and we do it lots of times every day. So 
uh, my, my hopefully my takeaway on this one is be comfortable that Bannon is not someone that has popped up lately. All right. Now, there's two ways people usually work with us. Um, you can use us as that connectivity and data platform. You may have a user front end. You may have a system of record that you choose to use, and that's fantastic. You can connect to us via API technology. That's great. That's about half of what people do with us. The other half actually use our TMS, which is our front end, and it helps them execute still integrated into their systems of record. So everything is kept in. And it's a point, Justin, I think you and I are going to talk about this concept of single version of truth a little bit later, but Bandy can support that. Um, I'm going to click over here. I got a little happy. Um, so it's the, the obligatory um, uh, brag slide. But if you were to take away that the concept of that, I want you to think there's three groups. If you were to look at it, you could sit here and say, hey, there's some direct shippers in that group. There's some really quality third party logistics companies in that group. And then the other thing you might be a bit surprised about is there's some really good technology companies in that group. We like to say on the technology side, you know, if you open up your Dell laptop and you see that little sticker down, usually in the lower left hand side that says Intel inside. Bain is that Intel inside for a lot of technology companies. Okay, I'm going to stop here and introduce my uh, a co presenter. And Justin, tell us a little bit more about ProShip and what you guys do. Sure. Well, basically, what Banyan does for over the road solutions, ProShip does for small parcel and same day. So just like Banyan, we'd love to have an enterprise software stack to communicate to or from. We have the ability to present multiple interfaces, whether they be technology only or whether it be a rich client that sits on, on a workstation, in a warehouse, in a store, something of that nature, in order to help provide value to your small parcel execution. That value is going to be along the basics, right? Clearly, we're multi-carrier. We know we're one of the fastest in the business, and we're very good at removing inefficiencies from within, within a communication stack as necessary. One of the more important things is that as a premisable solution, we are still versionless. So that when you buy ProShip, you never have to buy it again. And of course, though we have tons of experts, our ability to turn over control to warehouse managers, logistics managers who may be running stores and connect with things such as conveyors, other automated solutions, really help us to ensure that no challenge is too great for the ProShip solution. And when you want to think about that, on our next slide, we're going to show the where you might want to leverage something like ProShip. So most people know ProShip for retail because retail has one of the simplest complexities to understand. They may ship, be shipping tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to single digit millions of shipments per day. And that in and of itself is its own level of complexity. But manufacturers, third-party logistics, healthcare companies, and companies who ship regulated goods, they have their own complexities that you might look at. But if you are a standard retailer, manufacturer, or 3PL, understand we often will work with all three at the same time because for a, for a consumer, they don't care where the product comes from. They just would like to have access to all the inventory they could. So that's one of those things where we work with a lot. And as you can see, the, the feeds and speeds on here, uh, we do work with a very large number of the largest retailers out there. That being said, we also work with many manufacturers that, that are doing direct to consumer. And we also work with the third-party logistics providers. Well, because let's face it, they provide support to these retailers and manufacturers in order to allow for the best consumer experience out there. So with that, there's a lot we can help any company who's actually shipping small parcel to do. Now, let me throw it back over to you. Well, I, I do wanna highlight one thing. If you look at the green box up the top, I know that's subtle, that should be screaming out loud. So Oscar, some of my folks that are here, we're talking with you about doing, you know, 30% of the top 100 retailers trust mm -hmm. There's a reason why Banyan has chosen to work with ProShip, and we're very pleased about our relationship. This, you know, they are the best in the business. Justin's not going to say that out loud every time, so I will say that for him. 
They're the best in the business. And we're super excited about that. Okay. So I just wanted to call that one point out. Um, Appreciate it. Um, so this is a part where Justin and I are going to, and mostly Justin and I are going to riff a little bit on this. Things have kind of gotten weird. I'm going to say in the last 18 months, and then we'll get into uh, what's really happened in the last quarter. But for anybody that took economics or studies economics or, you know, downloads the Wall Street Journal's What's Next podcast and stuff, understanding economics is entirely different in the last 18 months. All those standard things, definitions of recessions and all the other components that go along into that, uh, it, economists are just kind of nuts right now. They're like, wait a second. You know, for the previous 50 years, if these five metrics came in, we could say this is what the state of the economy is. But it's just not happening. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so you have to become sort of a, not a macro, but a microeconomist to understand what's going on. And when we say microeconomist, this is where we're going to get to this quadruple threat issue. And, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing because a lot of these things can be solved. But there's a lot of microeconomic factors right now. They're going to impact your ability if you're a shipper of getting your thing to where it needs to be, or if you're a third-party logistics company, helping your people get their things where you need to be. So, Justin, you went up, you know, when you and I were chit-chatting, this was something that came, you were able to speak to so eloquently. Why don't you address what we're calling the quadruple threat right now and give, give the folks what we're seeing in our business? Yeah, it's very interesting because we almost pulled this down to just a triple threat, but no sooner did the West Coast ports, did the, the new agreement get signed, then now we've got a different problem on the West Coast. The Panama Canal, the lake that feeds it, is actually very low due to the current uh, uh, due to the current environment, the, the El Nino, I think it is. So with that, a lot of companies that have, have been using these, uh, these larger tankers to go through uh, the Panama Canal and be able to take advantage of the the coast along the or the ports along the Gulf Coast, sometimes taking advantage of the the ports along the East Coast, those ships are not going to be able to carry as much now. And so that's going to put even more pressure on the West Coast and pressure in a way that I I think we all felt wasn't going to exist. Mm -hmm. Combine that with the fact that the U, U, UPS Teamsters Union did choose to vote that they could use a strike as part of their negotiations. Now, we all hope they don't, but then again, let's face it, my software exists because three years before we opened our doors, UPS Teamsters went on strike. And everybody realized that it was very difficult to include multiple carriers in your small parcel solution. On top of that, if that's not enough, the FedEx pilots are unhappy. Uh, I don't know anybody's taken a, a, a flight lately, but there is quite the shortage of pilots, and I don't think that the logistics companies are, are being spared that. So that's one of those things that we're looking at. And then the railroad labor agreements, though. An agreement is in place. There is lots of grumbling from that union that they may push back, that they uh, there is the possibility of quiet quitting there, work slowdowns. And on top of all of that, we continue, and this may just be where the, the current media is focused, but we continue to hear about rail accident after rail accident, including what was it last week that a large bridge? In uh, Montana, fell? yeah. Yeah, in Montana. And so these are just things that though they, they may not directly affect you, they are going to put pressure on all logistics throughout the entire country, whether it's small parcel, same day, uh, inbound supplies, outbound. This is just the reality of the uh, of the the only constant we have is change. Well, we're seeing a lot of change right now and a lot of fluctuations uh, in everything that is deliverable at this point in time. Yeah, and, it, and I think what it does is it makes the change makes the case to be um, have a multi carrier strategy to make sure that your stuff is where it needs to be. You know, uh, the railroad labor agreements, you and I were chit-chatting about this, right? Um, administration puts into place, everyone's excited about it. But what we all forgot is each of the individual unions that serve the, the uh, railroad still have to vote on that. Now, we all have fingers that they all say, yeah, it's great. Uh, you can take all the politics out of it. We just want to make sure stuff still moves. But if stuff isn't moving in one channel, how do you do the other? 
So we'll be addressing that a little bit later. I did want to talk about the nearshoring activity. There's a couple of folks uh, uh, on this webinar that I've actually had very in-depth conversations about about um, Mexico as a is is a just the expansion of into out of and frankly intra Mexico shipping. Um, it, it's hard to um, it'd be hard to overstate the increased level of activity. Um, the, the, the pandemic, I think we'll talk about some pandemic compromises a little bit later, but they sped up an inevitable situation where folks are saying, I'd like my stuff made and put together a little bit closer to where I am. So wherever you are, you want a little bit closer because you're, you're a little concerned about getting stuff from other places. Uh, Mexico um, has taken on an increased level of importance amongst our customer base and how we've had to modify uh, and roll out new feature sets within our products. Uh, but it's not just the movement. I, I mean, Judge, you can talk about, it. there's a whole set of documents, which is what we do, right? It's what you mm -hmm. do, Justin. Yeah. What they're a bit different now than what they used to be, right? Well, yeah, and and I, I have to agree with you. This has been being set up for years, decades, really, uh, as as China has continued to empty the farm fields, if you will, fill up the cities, Labor is no longer endless there. It's no longer possible for them to find 100,000 people to start up a factory in three months. So that means cost of labor is going up in China. As we all know, there's a bit of a trade war going on right now. But when we put that on a backdrop of NAFTA for the last decade or more, which has allowed some goods to start being manufactured elsewhere inside North America, outside of the US directly, so Canada and Mexico, the enhancements that were made by that to the USMCA bill, uh, which basically replaced NAFTA, we are in an environment where as companies attempt to regionalize their supply chains, so ensure that, that their Asian supply chain can support itself, North American supply chain can support itself, European supply chain likewise. Um, as they go to do this, Mexico does become a great opportunity, especially when you're looking for a cost-effective labor force that is within reach and also has a lot of familiarity to the way the U.S. and Canada does business. So we have seen that shift. We've actually seen it the entire 20-plus uh, years we've been in business is a slow shift to more things being done, manufactured, refurbished in Mexico. And we don't expect that to stop. As a matter of fact, we expect it to accelerate. So if you're dealing with with Mexican carriers like Estafada and others, we expect to see them continue to get a larger and larger throughput over time. And of course, you want to ensure that you are producing your, your USMCA documents correctly, as well as, as your intra-Mexico documents correctly as well. So just something to keep in mind, because that's probably something you're going to need to deal with going forward. If you've already dealt with Canada, and the uh, the English French requirements that uh, occur in most of that country, well, then Spanish requirements won't be that difficult for you. But if they are, our companies can help. Yeah, that's thank you. Well said. Um, okay, so we painted the picture of some potential challenges, right? So now that's that's kind of the hurt and rescue game, right? So let's get to the rescue part of it. How do you need to pivot your tech stack? Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about more consolidating our tech stack. But one of the trends that we're starting to see right now is, is, is this concept of regionalizing your, your supply chain. Justin, I want you to talk a bit more, if you can, about maybe some of the new small parcel carriers and whether or not they're like, are, are they really regionals or not? Can, can you chat about that a bit? Yeah, we still haven't come up with a new word for it yet. They're like surgical regionals or something like that. So again, we're we're playing with the terminology to try to figure I it out. I think I've got my note here. It said micro regionals. I wrote micro that. Micro regionals. Yes, that, that's another good option. Well, okay. the interesting thing is, is that is that a lot of the regionals that we're seeing now only go where the majority of the people are, right? So they're not going to help with anything that you might be getting extended area surcharges on, anything like that. The United States Post Office is still a great solution for, for, for those uh, uh, cost-effective uh, extended area surcharge uh, control. But you are seeing a ton of new carriers that can help take a lot of pressure 
off of everything. So when you are looking at the, the possibility that, that one of your major carriers may have delivery delays, and as you're looking to what we're now referring to as um, rationalize your carrier mix, you need to make sure that you are mixing in some of these, some of the true regionals, some of the micro regionals, in, and layering things in ways that allows you to sustain shipping while still dealing with um, one of your major carriers possibly being uh, out, out of the loop for you for a couple of days, weeks, or even months. Yeah. Uh, as, that, that, as we talked about the uh, four horsemen earlier, the quadruple threat, if you will, uh, these pressures may, may come in very quickly. And if you're not ready to switch, if you don't have uh, some, some of you may have heard me put out uh, information on, on prescriptive business rules versus algorithmic business rules. If that's something you want to hear more about, uh, there's other information you can contact us. We can communicate about that. But companies with a lot of algorithmic business rules will be able to more easily say, I'm shifting from carrier A to carrier X, Y, and Z in order to disperse the, the volume that might have gone through that initial carrier. So being able to work with somebody that can help you do that, I think is going to be really important. Well, and that's the truth. So it's a great segue into the single source of the truth. It's, so we get a lot of questions like, how should I choose which carrier mm -hmm. to use in which lane with which mode and all of these other things? Well, you have to have all the information at your hand, analyze it, and then make your decisions. And that's where we, we talk about the single source of the truth. Now, I know you're going to get into separation of concerns. But what you, when we say single source of truth, when it comes to shipping, you have to have a consolidated viewpoint of your data to sit mm -hmm. here and say, carrier A, B, and C in this mode, in this lane, rock stars. A little sketchy over here, so maybe we should bring some people in. You can, you can position people against each other from negotiations and stuff like that. But can you explain to me, I think everybody here gets that, but can you explain the separation of concerns concept? This is something when you and I chit-chat, I learned a little bit more about. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I there's a, lo a lot of different uh, analogies we can use. We keep talking about jazz, right? You, you, you have the percussionist deal with the beat. You have the rhythm. People do rhythm. You know, in, the, in that case, you are separating the concerns of an ensemble. In business, we have a similar on similar ensemble. We got our ERP. It is a single source of the truth for everything money. You've got your WMS, which is a source of the truth for inventory. You've got other products. You know, you might have a CRM, which is a source of the truth for the customers themselves, the contact communication, things of that nature. So really, by identifying these items as to where they need to stay, you naturally start to put yourself into separation of concerns. Okay, Separation of concerns means you don't have your shipping software count inventory that starts to blur the lines. You're not really having a single source of the truth. And the more you blur those lines, the more you mix concerns, the more difficult a, an enterprise software stack is to troubleshoot. Now, can you do this? Yes, you can. But you need to be very clear and very careful. And, you, and everybody in the chain should know why you have mixed concerns. The nice thing is, is that by dealing with, with shipping products via a high-speed API, that API alone already separates concerns for you. So it makes it significantly easier for us to do what's known as binary isolation by saying, is the data, is the problem upstream or downstream from the API? So by having this, this combination of a single source of the truth, by properly separating your concerns, it means that if you do have a problem, is significantly faster to correct that problem. If you do choose to put in an enhancement, it is very clear what side of a particular point that enhancement goes on. And it just makes for a much more understandable enterprise software stack in the long term. Well, you just talked to, I'm going to switch this up, right? You mentioned jazz. So let me just change this around for you, right? We're going to riff on something else. I'm going to combine the consolidating your tech stack and leveraging best of breed solutions all up in one. Because I think it's a good segue you gave us right there. So, um, and there's also a question that Stuart, Stuart, I, I got your question here. I'm going to answer that at the end. It's a little more um, technical, but I think I'm going to address a little bit of it here. Okay. So when we talk about leveraging best of breed solutions, you know, 
we just mentioned ERPs. There are four or five ERPs, dependent upon where you are, that are just fantastic at what they do. There are some really good warehouse management systems. One of the neat things, uh, and this may actually get to RJ's comment that he uh, question he had, uh, is those best of breed solutions, both ProShip and Banyan, because of our relationship with each other, work very well with those. So when you salute, select your best of breed solution in another area of concern, be full, fully confident that, and we will suggest it, that ProShip and Banyan are best of breed solutions here, that we work very well together. And that's where you get your consolidating of your tech stack. You might want to sit here and say, hey, um, Oracle's my ERP. I really dig their uh, uh, their warehouse management system. Or you might want to get them, I don't care, an RF Smart or something else or a Kavala or something as well. Find your things, work them together, your shipping solution. It can be pro ship on the front end with L2, with, with Bandon providing over the road extensions, or it can be Bandon with, with, with pro ship providing the parcel. This is where you're going to drop down your consolidate, consolidate everything, put it together and make sure that it's a seamless and you're not having to put all that extra effort in and understanding how to maintain, manage, learn, train on a variety of different solutions because you've picked the best and you've mm -hmm. consolidated, integrated. So I consolidate those two points. But I do think the pandemic compromises is a topic we do need to spend a couple seconds on. So I'll, I'll let you talk about that, Justin. Yeah, and I touched on that a little bit. During the pandemic, there was a key phrase everybody was throwing around, carrier diversification. You have to diversify your carriers, right? And it was like you if you met any two logistics managers in the room, the, the first thing we're going is how are you diversifying, right? And the reason why that was so important is because you were looking for capacity. Capacity was king in 2000 and 2001. But as we saw at the end of 2000, I'm sorry, 2021 and 20, uh, 2020, um, and we, but as we saw at the end of, of 2022, there was more capacity than many of us needed. So the paradigm needed to change. And we have decided that, that the best way to explain that is by rather than saying diversification, by saying rationalization. Why do you need that carrier? Is it just for capacity? Is it providing any unique advantages for your particular customers? Is it there just as a secondary carrier, which is a very valid reason, given the uh, uh, the, the the quadruple threat that we've been talking about? Um, why is it there? How does it fit into the larger strategy? And I think that we we now, as a as an industry, we have the the ability now to to step back, think about what we've got, and actually rationalize each component as as you know, like I said, adding value, adding redundancy, or something else, if they're not doing one of those things, maybe that's not a great partner to be using anymore. So this is where, where we, we look at uh, not just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but actually doing uh, a business exercise to slowly back out some of the things that we did during the pandemic because, well, they were a little excessive. <laughs> they, yes, we have seen, you know, we're, we're untying some knots that we tied up during the pandemic. I think that's, that's good. The, the next slide we're going to get to, um, it's going to be a little bit more heavy on Justin because it's going to be a little bit more heavy on the technical side and he is significantly better um, at that than I am. I, I, I can talk to this um, first bullet point a little bit. So let me start, Justin, mm -hmm. in that, uh, so Bandon is known mostly for LTL, but we do over the road and we connect via APIs. And, and I like to tell everyone that says, well, my, my carrier's got an API. APIs are a bit like a road, right? You've got the Audubon, which is awesome. And then you've got the dirt road out behind grandma's house to the pond. And while they both facilitate the same thing, they're not the same thing, right? Um, I do think though, that carriers are getting better with their APIs, uh, no, I know they're getting better and they're focusing much more on security, uh, which is really, really important for us. But when that comes along, there's some complexity with that. Not, to, not everybody understands all the different components of um, uh, APIs, the complexity of those, the rules you need to follow. 
And as we, we add more carriers and we update and maintain those, it's, um, let's say it's, I don't say it's maybe harder, but it's just much more sophisticated, which is a good thing for everybody. So why don't you chat about that, Justin, a bit more? Yeah. So if you've been paying attention to your carrier partners, they're, one of the bigger things we're seeing, though not evenly, is that we're seeing a lot of movement towards OAuth and TLS 1.3. What that is, is just saying, I have the right to actually transmit this information. And as I transmit it, it's going to be in an encrypted tunnel. Okay. The problem is, is that not all your carriers are doing that. Not all of them uh, will be doing that in even the next two to three years. So as you have that large carrier mix, it's going to be hit or miss. Somebody's got to maintain those. And it's going to be a continuous set of technical changes that go across the entire breadth of your carrier uh, of your carrier portfolio. And if you switch out a carrier, again, you're going to have to be looking at things like, are they this secure in this? What are my risks? And I think that uh, we have relatively uh, straightforward PII, personally identifiable information, right? Because when you're looking at any shipment, you really only need four pieces of information uh, five, if you want to do business rules, we need to know where that package is coming from, where that shipment is coming from, where it's going to, what is being shipped. And usually that's just weight dimensions uh, for over the road. You might need commodity classes, things of that nature. Um, and then finally, we want to know how you want to get it there. Right. So that's not a ton of information there until usually we get into the fifth one, which we call metadata. That's that's something where you might say, well, this is a platinum customer right? So use the platinum customer rules. When we look at just those five pieces of data, it's not a lot, but because of the fact that we might be dealing with, with a dozen or more carriers, um, uh, we might be dealing with 50 or more service levels available to us. We want to make sure that everything is kept clean. And so because of that, it's a large technical challenge. Mm -hmm. And as the carriers continue to change that, you need somebody who's uh, there's a reason we're referred to as best of breed, the two companies, right? Because we maintain that for the customers so they don't have to. So with all that change, we really do want to ensure that that by combining our forces or by using us individually, the segment that you're looking at, you won't have to deal with that. It's just going to be handled for you. Uh, so that things continue to get more secure as the carriers allow, caveat. Um, and that we do the best job we can at protecting that PII, even though you might say, well, it's just name and address. It's not really that much. doesn't matter. It's still PII. And our security departments are very concerned and want to ensure that, that, that we help our customers maintain the securest data set possible. And I think that gets into, um, into one of our favorite conversations, right? Which is the, you know, who, who's responsible? Who's responsible? And I think uh, the favorite phrase that the customers have is they want one throat to choke in the yep. event something goes wrong, right? And I, that's where the way we've configured our relationship, um, you can use ProShip through Banyan. Banyan is your point of contact. You can use Banyan through ProShip. ProShip is your point of contact. So whoever is your point of contact has that responsibility to solve the problem for you. None of this stuff pointing in either direction is going, oh, no, that's carrier A's, carrier B's problem. Yeah, and um, that goes back to the consolidation of the tech stack. There's also a consolidation of the service environment, the customer service environment. And I think that's one of the reasons we've been so successful together on that. Um, I do want to, I'm, you know, I think Matthew, you send us, if I'm looking at this, we got, we got a couple minutes. So I'm going to maybe speed this up a little bit, but I do want to talk about the normalizing the data. We can talk about some of the other stuff a little bit different, but let me give you one example of how we do it and why this is a super important. So if anybody's ever seen an EDI 210 or a 214, it's like cartoon swearing, right? No one understands what the hell it is. That's part of what Banyan does. When we ingest that, the first thing we do is we make that normal human language. It allows people to understand the information. It allows us to share that information with companies like ProShip or with systems of records. I know, Justin, that there's some normalization that you guys do on your ProShip side. It seems a little technical, but just a light touch on how you take really um, 
vast amounts of data written in non-person language, right? And turn it into a way that other people can consume it and take action on it. Well, there's, there's a couple of different ways you can go about that, about thinking about that. But I'm going to go back to separation of concerns. Um, the reason I'm bringing that back in is because one of the big things you want to look at for separation of concerns is having a good contract between the components. So when you're reaching out to Banyan, the structure of that data is the contract. And we're, does not matter how, let's say, SIA, um, uh, YRC, I'm sorry, they're yellow again, uh, white, yellow, uh, XPO, how they need to receive the data. That's handled on the back end. So you as a consumer don't need to care. You as right. an IT person, uh, somebody who's running Blue Yonder, somebody who's running something else, don't need to care that you've added four or five more carriers because the input is exactly the same. And that, um, like I said, that goes hand in hand with uh, uh, separation concerns. The great set of separation concerns has a great contract. Um, you know, they say that that uh, fences make great make for great neighbors. Well, fences around IT products make for really great tech stacks. Yeah, that's well. I like it. Well said. Let me move to our next slide uh, on this. Um, I think you talked about it. You, you talked about the reality is that you know you were talking about the elements of of yep. what a shipment. Shipments really are shipments. I know we create these. The industry has these mode specifics, but you've got a thing or a box of things or a pallet of things or a truckload of things that need to go from some place to the others. There's some sophistication with different different modes, but when you if you've got the right tech stack in the shipping, it's really just moving things from one place to the other on that. Now, carrier connectivity is getting more complex, but I don't want us to get scared about the complexity. I think the, actually the complexity that they're bringing to the table, and I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud because I'm usually not a fan, a fan of regulation and complexity, but it's good. It's actually protective, right? There are many ways in which we can help break out that data, allow us to do a little bit better analysis, compliant with government rules and regulations, particularly when it comes to international shipping and stuff. So, um, the one concern, though, you're going to get about this, and maybe you can touch on this, well, it's maybe the two. We've got, there's a lot of people saying they can do a lot of things. I think pandemic came into that, particularly on tracking and, and visualization, right? That was just the coolest thing in the world, if I knew where my shipment was. I mean, that was the mm -hmm. most important thing. But one of the things most people don't think about is what, what Justin and I were just talking about is there's this complexi complexi complexity, the tech stack and everything. You know, you do need to have some folks figure out how to wire this stuff together, particularly with the changes coming, right, Justin? Agreed. And and I think our mutual theory is always, let's have those people do what people are good at. Right. Let's not have them try to memorize all these things. Let's let the software do that. Software is good at boring, redundant things, such that your labor can be as engaged as possible. You can mm -hmm. get as much as many units or, or uh, uh, line items per order done per day as possible by automating everything that should be automated and letting the humans do what humans are good at. Deciding that box is broken, uh, deciding how to, how to pack that box or present that box in a way that's going to be pleasing to whoever opens it. Um, uh, re uh, in, Ensuring that they stack that pallet in a way that, that uh, uh, isn't going to crush everything on the bottom but is also going to um, make it easy to unload. Now, these are all human things. We're good at solving those puzzles. They challenge us. Remembering exactly what the fuel surcharge uh, percent discount is for, for zone three is not something that humans are good at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is let's leverage, let's actually place greater value on that institutional tribal knowledge that you have. Maybe it's in the warehouse at the shipping station and things like that. So if we can get best of breed, consolidated tech stack that automates 80%. It's that last 20% mm -hmm. that requires human innovation that's going to separate our people. It's going to separate our, 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 our uh, customers from their, from their, their uh, competitors. Um, let me move into, um, I think maybe this might be the part where we're going to talk a bit about, uh, oh, we have a poll question. And I think this is, it's, 
I think it went a little too far on the poll question. Let me go back a bit. Yeah, here we go. I'm sorry. I got super happy with my mouse there. <laughs> Clicked a few things. Okay. This is our sale. This is our pitch, value proposition, whatever you want to call it on, on why band and, and why pro ship. So I'll talk about a couple at the beginning. I'll let you go after the end-to-end -end seamless shipping solution. You and I know we, we can both probably do everybody's, each other's roles here. But let me start strategically aligned. And boy, that sounds almost ambiguous enough to be meaningless. But let me tell you what I think the best part of that strategy is, is our commitment on the customer service side. Um, companies that join us stay with us. And that's on both parts. That was super important when we were looking to work with someone. And I know when we spoke with, with, with you, Justin, that we wanted to make sure that we partnered with someone. The technology aligned really well, which was nice. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the environment, uh, the culture aligned really well. Um, look, when we were, we, we had a lot of our customers, I'm looking right now at the list of people that are, that are on this. There are several of them are customers. And you told us, you know, if you're going to expand this, make sure you do it with some really good, cool people. Uh, that's why ProShip's here. Uh, I talked about our customer centric values. I think the other piece is, um, Justin, you mentioned you can have a ProShip front end with some band and helping on the back end or vice versa. We've experienced that right now in some rollouts and it's gone really, really well. It's not, we, we haven't had any hiccups in it. I've been, pre, I've been pretty pleased with, with our rollouts and how it's been supported. Kind of like we're both best of breed or something. Yeah, I know. Boy, how did that fit in here, right? Yeah, we we've we, the partnership has worked very well. We we do definitely. Uh, the I think the idea is that we both focused on boiling down what is needed by our customers, and we both came up with uh, with a similar. You only need five things to ship anything, um, but you need the uniqueness within each carrier. To communicate and take advantage of them, and I'm, I'm gonna. I, I love to keep bringing back the technical term separation of concern. The reality is, is while you, you guys found a niche, focused, and doubled down on over the road shipments, ProShip found a niche, found it the the uh, gathered the skill set, and we focused on small parcel, which rolled us into same day. So mm -hmm. the reality is, is that is that we 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 kind of both started at the center, right? Just at the at that warehouse door, and we went ahead and we went different directions from that warehouse door, which makes our our technologies fold together very well, because you know all the idiosyncrasies of of what FAKs are and and commodity classes and what might qualify for this that and the other thing, how to communicate, like you said, with an EDI X twelve uh, to a carrier because they still require that for some reason. Um, meanwhile, we are focusing on on the newer APIs that are coming out, as well as the ability to do high speed premise execution for conveyor based solution. So as we continue to look at the strengths that each of our companies have brought together, because we've isolated in those areas, it does allow for a great uh, end to end solution when we're done to cover anything that's going to go out a warehouse door or potentially walk out the front of a store. I want to get to, um, we're going to run this poll question. I think, um, Matthew, if you guys want to pop this up, because I'm getting a lot of questions. When I'm looking at my questions here, and we're going to try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, I, I keep. I just keep getting it. I'm glad, Matthew, we had the poll question. You, yeah, you thought it through really well. Uh, how do we engage you? So th this is the quickest way. Answer this poll question <laughs> that we have up here and tell us, you know, do you want to talk to, don't worry, we'll have someone besides me on this call with you, all right? So we'll get someone that can go a little bit more in depth, but do you want to chat with uh, with the Bayonet team or, the pro, or, or both? That'd be awesome if you wanted to chat with both. So we'll keep this up uh, um, while we're doing this and we have this poll question up. Matthew, is it okay if I just jump to a couple questions right now, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. We'll leave this up here for another two or three minutes and then we'll uh, go ahead and end it and yeah. So let, let me hit, I'm going to hit a couple that I know I can answer real quick. So that'll be just a few. Um, um, so Mario, I understand who you are and what you're doing. You're asking, do we, do we integrate or utilize third-party platforms such as, I'm not going to name the names because those are our competitors. No, we do that. We are three times more carrier connected than the people you brought up on the screen right there. Okay. I have 330 LTL API connections put into place. ProShip has the most 
parcel connections globally of any other company around. So uh, you certainly could call those people you put there, but we don't use them because we uh, we, we replace those, to be quite frank with you. Okay. Um, I do see one. I actually, I see three here about integrations, SAP, Blue Yonder, Oracle, see Salesforce. Here, here's the deal. Um, we probably have already connected with all of those, but if not, it's not really an issue. We publish our APIs out. Either people have uh, staff there or partners to integrate, or, or we do it. We're probably integrating. We may have eight to 10 integration projects right now. They're not super long, 18 to 20 week projects. Just not the way it is. We're very, very good at the technology and how we put it together. So I can't answer all of these. Are we integrated with those? But I, I can tell you, um, if we aren't, it's not that big a deal. We can be. Um, we hit Stuart's question. Yeah. Can you do that one? Yeah. So here's, again, I'm going to bring up my favorite phrase of this one, separation of concerns. Our recommendation is that you do not do address validation at the scale. Okay. So that could be as you're building the pallet, that could be as you're putting everything in the box. Our recommendation is that you push address validation, including RDI, up all the way to the customer if you can. Now, 3PLs can't always do this. So we've recommended you import the data, you leverage an API. ProShip does offer a third party APIs in order to allow for address validation. Um, but as, as Stuart mentioned here, a lot of uh, packages don't have the right address. And most importantly, they may not have appropriate residential indicator. That's mm -hmm. important because in the United States, we the carriers are charging more for residential deliveries. If you're doing a residential delivery with LTL, you probably need a lift gate. You probably need yeah, yep. all these other things. Um, and you may actually have to move to a smaller truck to actually get it to fit in that neighborhood, uh, depending upon where it's going to. So that that RDI or residential delivery indicator is really important. But best practice is to do that address validation. Um, even if you're leveraging a, the uh, ProShip API or Banyan API to do that, to do that address validation as close to the customer as possible, preferably in the cart if you can. All right. Uh, oh, real quick, Alan, I'm going to go ahead and just end this poll. Thank you to everybody who has submitted that. Uh, we're going to have somebody from our teams uh, be in touch right after the webinar with you um, as quickly as we can get them out to you. So, All right. So then let me move to the next slide, which is our question slide, right? This is my favorite slide because we're already there. Um, um, let, I'm going to ask, here's one for you. I think Justin is perfectly for you. I hear this all the time, right? USPS. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows how to do UPS, DHL, FedEx, Purelater, Canpar, all of these that you connect with. But you, USPS is a little bit different. So I get this. Do I need a Pitney Bowes account? You could probably say, do I need an Indicia account or stamps.com, right? So could you chat? Could you answer that question? Well, and, and you started going down the right, the right path there. There are multiple ways to access the value of the United States Post Office. Pitney Bowes is one of them. Indicia Stamps is another one. There are several other ones out there. The United States Post Office continues to innovate. Um, we have seen more changes out of the US Post Office in the last two years than, well, frankly, than I saw in the prior 20 years. Yeah. Um, so th there is a lot changing there. And depending upon your size, you may actually want to deal directly with the Post Office. Do they so, have PSAs available for individual people now, individual companies? Of course, they always have, right? It's just always been rather difficult. You need to set up an ACH. You need to, and back in the days of manifesting, it was even worse because you needed to have some very, very detailed auditing done of your printers and uh, the goods that are coming out of the warehouses. And, and at any point in time, the, the uh, a representative of your local postmaster could come in with uh, calibrated weights and demand to uh, uh, test your scales, you know, things of that nature. So the post office is slowly moving into the 20th century um, and there are multiple ways about it. I would just tell customers that don't think that there's only one way to access the post office and you should actually look at your unique requirements rather okay. than assuming 
that there's a best way for everybody to enter the post office. I also think, so hold on, I have a limited knowledge. I've been involved in the parcel side. You certainly are much more qualified for this. I think the the, the post office, um, when you take a look at on-time delivery rates, and stuff, they're a lot better than what people think they are. They, they made massive improvements last year. And when you consider the fact that the United States Post Office is the only carrier that we can think of as a normal carrier that cannot refuse shipments. Yeah, you're right. right. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I forgot. That's exactly right. Um, I got another one for you when I look at this up here that says, um, heard you talk a lot about first and final mile and parcel. Isn't parcel a part of the final mile? So let me start. I'm, I'm going to start this because there's the first and the final mile. You and I've chatted about this, how it could be a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So we could look at the uh, first and final mile. Could be LTL, could be parcel. Uh, first mile could be, hey, I've got this stuff and I'd like this carrier to pick it up. And the carrier says, I can get to it Thursday unless you deliver it to the dock today. And I can send it out today. That could be the first mile. But that's a perspective, right? That could be the final mile because it could be the manufacturing going, I'm done. Right. So I just need to get it out. Can you talk about first final mile parcel, the nomenclature, how it could be confusing? Okay. Well, first, if you're if if you're a procurement person, first mile is completely different to you. First mile is from the manufacturer into your inventory, whether that be in a store or in a warehouse. For most of us though, listening, first mile is how you get from your warehouse into a carrier's uh, delivery pattern, right? So you could, for example, uh, zone skipping, line hauling, all these other phrases that you might heard, might have heard, is a good way for first mile to inject into and shorten the final mile. So the last leg that the that the actual person who's going to exchange custody from the carrier over to the recipient, right? That is um, uh, usually what we think of as final mile. Is that is that whoever is going to do the custody exchange to the recipient. So first mile or middle mile, right? Because we can kind of break that down into a couple of different legs is how are we going to get it to that, the, the body that's going to do that custody exchange. Meanwhile, there'll be custody exchanges all through the entire process. So first mile could be, like I said, a line haul, a zone skip. Um, middle mile could be somebody else. We've seen a lot of changes in the current uh, uh in the current options that we had prior to the pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that are handling middle mile. Some of them you don't see. If you're a very large customer, you may be demanding that they handle that middle mile for you. And then of course that final mile that we talked about, that's the person that somebody sees at their door actually dropping the package off. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard, right? So I think you talked about dependent upon what seat you're sitting in, the language is different. Um, Maybe if I could sum that up, um, you can call it what you want. We can take care of it. Uh, so on that, I do. I'm going to have one more question that I know I can answer. Hey, RJ, you've got a really good question in here. It seems to be complex enough that I think maybe we ought to address that after this, because I probably have a couple of questions to better understand what you're asking. So I hope that's going to be OK for you. But we will answer that. I do get one here. It says, hey, look, I've got a couple different LTL carriers, but I also use a 3PL. How does that work with your system? Uh, just fine. It's a normal everyday thing. Uh, we'll look at the 3PL. I don't want to say we're going to set them up as a carrier because I don't want a 3PL to punch me in the face for saying that out loud. But the, <laughs> the point being is 3PLs, we connect with many of them. And so think about a connection to a 3PL, which has their outreach as well. And that's easy for ProShip and Bandon to be to do. It's an everyday occurrence. Probably more than half of our people that ship stuff have are heavy on the carriers with a couple 3PLs in there. So not an issue for us. Um, I put the picture up here just to prove that, that we didn't say that we hung out a lot together. We were lucky enough that several of us, you see Mr. Matthews right in the middle there of that picture, but we got to go up and hang out at the ProShip shop and and work with them. It was a delightful time. We did a lot of process mapping that day. We did some commercial terms. We did some agreements on, on how we were going to share customers. But probably the biggest thing I think we got out of that is how do we service our customers? Who takes what and does what thing with it to make sure the customer feels, I can call ProShip, 
I can call banyan, tomato, tomato, all works out well. So that was one of our neat things. We were at their conference, uh, Converge, fantastic part of that program. Uh, they're going to be at ours coming up in uh, Cleveland in September, Connect 2023. So you can find us if you hang it out at each other's places. Um, we've got a couple questions on how do we follow up. Here's how you do it. I don't know. You can't see. I don't know if you can see my mouth or not, but I'm hanging on Andrew Larson's face over there. We actually have a guy that if you wanted to chit chat, you can right there. Andrew Davidson, both named Andrew out of Minnesota. That's very odd in our business when you talk to either one. It's kind of hard to discern between the two. But you can work with Andrew. If you've got an account manager and you're a, um, 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 a banding customer, just call your account manager. They can help you out. ProShip, they've got it down pretty tight. Dave's there, his whole group, Tony, the whole group there. But if you just reach out to the ProShip team at sales at ProShip, they are really good in how they... Uh, uh, assign you someone's going to answer your questions. Um, I think we have three minutes left, Justin. Uh, I think we've done a really good job fitting it within our hour. Well done, yeah. sir. Do you have yeah. any final statements you want to say before we close this out, buddy? Of course, I want to thank you for inviting us. Uh, we're very happy to be partners with you. We're very happy to try to help explain that partnership to all y'all who have uh, joined us for this. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with Banyan and, well, anybody who's... Uh, uh, on this webinar as well in the future. Thank you. Hey, thank, thanks, Justin. Always love hanging out with you. Matthew, thank you very much for uh, keeping us on time, on track, putting the other stuff. I'll let you close it out, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, the replay will be sent out within 72 hours here to everybody on the webinar. Thanks again for attending. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys.